This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast. Is Vince McMahon now just a figurehead for the WWE? CM Punk rejected by the WWE. What does he do now? The rated R superstar Adam Copeland talks with Chris Jericho about jumping from the WWE over to AEW. And Tony Khan has a very rough week, to say the least. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the Pro Wrestling Podcast Podcast. What the fuck is up, everybody? Welcome. Come on in. Welcome to another episode of the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. I am your boy, Seth Grimes, here mid-October, creeping our way up to Halloween, my favorite time of the year. It's been cold and rainy as fuck, so I haven't been able to go out and pick pumpkins or do any of that kind of stuff i have gotten to murder a couple people but we'll keep that on the low do that every october just to keep in the spirit of the season you know what i'm saying but enough about that we have a huge jam-packed show for you this week lots of news going on in the world of professional wrestling lots of people talking lots of people saying really stupid shit Right? Or at least one person in particular. We will get to all of that. But first, before we jump into anything, if I could bug you to please hit that subscribe button down below. As that is uh, inching ever so close to my first 1,000 subscribers. Yes, I'm still a newbie peon. If you haven't noticed, click down and subscribe it doesn't even hurt you it takes like two seconds you could have gotten it done three times in the time that i'm saying this please get me to 1000 and that way i can rule the world with all of that said let's go ahead and hop on into our first story here this week Is he in? Is he out? Is he in? Is he out? No, we're not talking about CM Punk. We're talking about Vince McMahon. God damn it. Vince McMahon, the CEO, the chairman of the board for the WWE, not the CEO. Isn't that Nick Khan? It's all mixed up now. Nick was the president. Now I think he's the CEO. Vince is the chairman of the board for the entire TKO, but... Is that all he really is? Speculation has been running around now as to whether or not Vince McMahon has been rendered effectively just a figurehead for the WWE. A fucking bronze statue sitting out in the hallway. Just to just like the fucking Ronald McDonald or the, the, uh, the colonel for KFC. The figurehead, the mascot. We need to have Vince McMahon if we're buying WWE. That's what Ari Emanuel was saying. But does Ari Emanuel actually want Vince touching anything? As it was reported this week that Triple H is now effectively completely in control of creative once again. This has been going on over the last couple weeks. With more on this We hop on over to our favorite dirtbag journalist, Mr. Dave Meltzer, as he talks about the status of Vince McMahon in the WWE. What's up with Vince? Nothing's up with Vince. Nothing. I mean, as far as, I mean, the story going around regarding creative, and it's, it's essentially the case. Vince has backed off on creative for now. You know, that's how it was described to me. For now, he's backed off. I mean, when he... You know, I mean, he still has the power. If he wants to change something, he will. But right now, um, he's pretty much backed off on that. So right now, what you're seeing right now is pretty much what I was told 99% or whatever, 95% Paul Levesque. I mean, he's still around, but, um, you know, and there's 
probably going to be input when it comes to main event programs and things like that going forward. But right now, um, you know, it is mostly the Paul Levesque show now as far as like what's going on, you know, what's going on in TV and everything. Is there a reason for this? Um, I mean, people will say it's the merger, but Vince still has the power. So it's just, um, I don't, there's like, whatever the reason is, I don't know. I mean, it's just something that, uh, you know, Vince is backing off for now. I feel like Meltzer's hiding something. He's got that look on his face like he's not telling the full story yet. It's almost giving a little wink and a nod like, I don't know. But uh, one person who does have a theory on what might be going on here is our boy over at Fightful, Sean Ross Sapp, who's been breaking all the biggest news over the last couple years. And uh, he's been doing some digging into this himself. And I like that there is uh, other journalists on the job. Nick Hausman's doing a lot of great work lately as well. You don't hear much from the Wade Kellers these days. I think he's kind of, you know, washed up at this point. But there's a lot of great pro wrestling journalists doing a lot of great work. And uh, Sean Ross Sapp has his own theory about what might be going on behind the scenes over at the WWE. Check out this clip. So, Sean, do you think he's doing this right now, or rather not doing creative right now as heavily involved because he's so focused on everything going on with TKO and this new merger and everything that's going down with that? Or do you think he's seen it more so as, hey, let's let Triple H do things because clearly uh, it's working what he's doing, or at least when he's doing stuff, it seems to be working. So here's what I suspect. Suspect. Educated suspicion, call it. Vince never wanted to leave. Vince thought he was bulletproof. He thought he was bulletproof for a long, long time. And then when he was made to believe that it'd be a good idea to retire, he thought that, He could just go away for a little bit, come back. However, he does retire. He sees that not only do numbers not go down, they succeed. And not only do they succeed, they thrive, Denise. And, ooh, it is hard to see somebody doing even better without you. And then December rolls around, and Vince pushes his way back in. Stephanie gets the hell out of there, just like she did when she found out he was being investigated. She got the hell out of there. Vince pushed his way back in, pushed his way back into creative, and Vince came back under the guise of looking for a sale. However, what we didn't get was a sale. What we got was a merger. And what we got was the deal that allowed Vince to come back. Because if they had sold to Disney, Bob Iger ain't playing that shit. If they sold to any other number of places, they ain't playing that shit. However... Ari Emanuel dealt with a sale in which people were going to stay on in Dana White. However, Dana White, despite all of his faults, is far more useful than Vince McMahon is at this stage. I think Vince took the deal that allowed him to stay. And now, and, and now that the deal has gone through, they're like, oh, you can stay as this statue over here. But this other guy is going to run creative and all this stuff. I think that Vince has been effectively rendered a figurehead in WWE. Think, not not reporting. That's just what I think. How do you think that's, how do you think Vince's ego is handling that? Probably horribly. This was something that people were talking about when the merger took place. The deal that this, everybody was saying that this was the deal that Vince McMahon took because it was the deal that kept Vince McMahon on board. And you hear uh, Ari Emanuel had said in that initial, um, you know, when they officially did their press release, that he had said that he insisted on keeping Vince McMahon on board. Now, on the surface, that sounds like it could be smart, right? He kept, and, and to be fair, to Ari Emanuel and TKO and Endeavor and all that, this was exactly what he did with the UFC. He bought the UFC and used his machine behind the UFC, but he kept 
everybody running the UFC. He didn't come in and say, "Hey, I want fucking this guy to fight that guy. I don't want Con- I want Conor McGregor to fight John Jones." In a no weight class, no rules fucking barbed wire cage match. He could do that because he owns it, but he he just Dana White's already doing a good job. So theoretically, he could just be like, "Look, we need Vince McMahon's the wrestling genius." So let's bring in, we got to keep Vince McMahon on board to keep the genius in going, as, as Dusty would say, for the WWE. That could make sense, and that's certainly a theory. But all of this was going down at the same time that Vince McMahon was caught up in a bajillion different scandals. And who leaked those scandals? Because as Sean Ross Sapp has said before on his show, uh, who was it, the New York Times or Post or one of those fucking New York gimmick papers? I think it was the Times broke the story of Vince. They're not digging around for wrestling stories. So somebody leaked that to the press from the board of directors that there was something shady going on. And could it be Nick Khan himself? Uh, you know, people had speculated that even, that this was a power play from the beginning to oust McMahon. Now McMahon does not have power. And theoretically, Vince McMahon can be just overruled and set aside. Ari Emanuel could have come in, granted Triple H full power, or at least pulled Vince McMahon off of the creative, said, hey, Vince, we need you over here on this side of the fence. Let Paul do all the creative and stuff over there. Don't worry about that stuff. Wink, wink. And with all the scandals brewing and everything else and kind of setting up Triple H to be able to handle everything on his own on that end, Nick Khan, obviously the, a fucking mastermind of a businessman. Could all of this just be a plot to, you know, one scandal away from Vince being pushed right out the fucking door and gone and they're able to move on without Vince McMahon? You know, the Endeavor side of the board, they had to, they got to pick more board members than WWE side did during the merger. So they theoretically really could just push Vince McMahon right out of the picture. And for now, are they just kind of stripping him of his duties? What is he doing all day up in his office? What is he doing for the WWE specifically? What's he doing for TKO? He's the chairman of this board of TKO. So theoretically, he could even be having input on UFC. Which, God forbid, Vince McMahon gets his dirty little paws in the creative of UFC. It's not going to happen. So maybe like whoever's doing the booking... In the UFC, and then Dana White as the president, and you got, you know, Nick Khan and Triple H on the WWE side, Vince, the figurehead above them all, the fucking bronze statue just standing in front of the fight business, right? Because even Dana White got a lot of inspiration, got a lot of tactics from Vince McMahon. Ari Emanuel has said that Vince McMahon, he's consulted Vince McMahon multiple times on different business deals, probably about the UFC before he bought the shit, probably talked to Vince about the the fight business, so to speak, because as much as WWE is an entertainment product, it's still a fight product at the same time. It's a really weird kind of in between, right? It's a live event, it's a sport, it's a it's entertainment, it's a show, it's a soap opera, but it's fighting kind of too, and you, you got individual talents that are contracted, and it, it, there's a lot of crossover there. So Vince sitting on the board as the, as the chairman is kind of a smart business move, but because he's so goddamn shady, and because he's got so many lawsuits brewing... Who knows what, you know, if they could just be behind the scenes, just kind of tweaking and maneuvering everything so that he can just be cut right out of the whole situation and WWE moves on without him. There were rumors that Steph and Triple H were splitting up. I don't believe that those are true, but theoretically, could Triple H and Nick Khan be the WWE side and all McMahons are removed completely from WWE 
Shane already doesn't work there. Steph already pulled out. But if Steph's not even married to Triple H, again, that's room. I'm not, I shouldn't even be giving it light. I'm not even, not barely even speculating that it happens. But I'm just hypothetically, we could be looking at, at some point in the our lifetime, a world where McMahons have nothing to do with it. And actually, Triple H is the fucking Don Mega of the wrestling business, along with Nick Khan behind the scenes. I don't even see Nick Khan as a lifer, though, to be honest. You know, I see him as an opportunist, a resume builder, a career. You know, he's already had he's got had his career as an agent in Hollywood and he's doing this WWE thing. I'm sure he's done other stuff that I don't know off the top of my head or don't remember. Whatever. It doesn't fucking matter. He's a very successful man. And very well connected and well known before he even came to WWE. I'm sure WWE will not be his last stop. But look at all the gains he has made since. Even if you were to leave WWE today, his fucking look what I did over there is a mile long, dude. He has overseen a complete transformation of the WWE. And honestly, you have to give him so much credit because, you know. Uh, we don't know exactly what Vince is doing, but it's certainly uh, ever since Nick Khan's been in the picture, WWE has transformed itself into a, a completely different product. Their TV deals are outrageous at this point. Look at all their pay-per-views now. Their premium live events are all in stadiums essentially now. Uh, all different parts of the world Two, they're cashing in on that effect that AEW had that, hey, we don't really go there often, so let's do a stadium show there. You know, they're going to go do it in Australia. And, and you know, they if they can build those markets in twice a year or once a year, every year, fuck, man, they're doing great business there. They're doing, you know, the, the obviously the merger in itself. Uh, big, big things. I do definitely see a potential here for a world where no McMahon has their paws in the WWE at all. Um, that's a very real thing. And that remains to be seen how all this will play out. And again, going back to the very beginning of this, I could all just could just be wrong altogether. And Vince McMahon uh, could be on board because they believe that he is the genius, baby. And he's the Dana White to the WWE, but uh, we shall see how it plays out. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Will Vince end up getting ousted? Was this the plan all along? Is it a contingency plan in case he fucks up, or are they completely in the Vince McMahon business and we're reading it all wrong, or should Vince just not be there to begin with because it's a whole big moral issue to even have him on the fucking in the company to begin with? Let me know your thoughts down in those comments below. Hit subscribe. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. Hey, pal. If you're going to build a statue of me, it should have wider shoulders. It's got to look broad. His thighs have to be meaty. Meaty thighs. Well, our good buddy Tony Khan has had himself a pretty rough week this week, starting with the build-up to his big head-to-head -head situation he was going into with NXT. Tony Khan already probably pissy because he had to have his night moved to Tuesday from Wednesday, but he stacked the card. And then NXT was stacking their card, too, because they were trying to prove a point. They were going to squash AEW like a fucking bug. That was their goal. That is undeniable that that was their goal. And this set Mr. Tony Khan off. Nick Hausman over at House of Wrestling had tweeted that Triple H and Shawn Michaels look to send Tony Khan a message. And that's exactly what they sought out to do. Tony Khan's show was going to be on their night, Tuesday. Remember, they had already fucked. They had to move to Tuesday because they got their ass kicked on Wednesday. I don't care what anybody says. That's exactly what happened. It was the better move, too, because more nights on more wrestling, everybody wins. But they were intent to prove a point on Tuesday night as they stacked the card 
with I mean literally stacked the fucking card with with John Cena with fucking LA Knight, The Undertaker. And I hear people saying, oh, they didn't advertise The Undertaker. Bullshit. They put the dong, the gong in the fucking ad. You don't put the gong in the ad if he's not going to be there. You're just stacking the card. They trotted Jade Cargill out onto the fucking show to put up against her ex-company. They had Cody Rhodes come out to make a special announcement. What's Cody Rhodes going to say? What's his special announcement? Tune in. Are we watching NXT or are we watching fucking WWE All-Stars? The fucking all the heavy hitters. The fucking, this is the, they're bringing on legends out of retirement for this show. This is like fucking Raw 25, but it's on NXT. Weird. But they're trying to prove a point. And that's exactly what they sought out to do, and that's what they did. They decimated Tony Khan, AEW, in the fucking in the ratings. Both of them under a million, but NXT nine hundred thousand and change to AEW's sad and pathetic six hundred thousand and change. Though the key demographic was about the same, roughly give or take. NXT still taking out the edge here, but you see, Tony Khan did not take too kindly to this. He says, I have a message for them. And he tweeted this bald asshole picture, which I think I've heard is from a TV show or some of something of some kind. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but it went on. Then they go into, to, they even went as far as to do like the overtimes and shit, right? Uh, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to have a run over both NXT and AEW back and forth. Oh, I'm going to do a fucking first NXT. I believe said first, their first 30 minutes are going to be no commercial. So then fucking, and it, Tony Khan says, okay, well my, my first 30 minutes are no commercial too. Maybe even a little bit more. Maybe my first 32 minutes are no commercial. Fuck you. And then, and then, uh, one of them, I don't even remember who said they were going to fucking have a little bit of a run over. I don't know if it was NXT's rebuttal to that. They're going to be like, yeah, we'll run a little long. Tony Khan says, yeah, we'll run a little bit long too. My dick's big too, see? Could have been vice versa. It doesn't matter at this point. Who cares? And Tony Khan's like, you know what? We're going to do a fucking buy-in. A buy-in, and we're going to put Eddie Kingston on there and put his fucking, all, all seven of his titles on the line. This was a war, and it got under Tony Khan's skin, as you can see over here, hyping up his shit. Did anybody feel like Dynamite was close to perfection? No, probably not. Uh, thank you all for watching Dynamite. I thought last night was one of our best shows. I think somebody had replied to that. I should go check out. He's got replies, right? I don't know. I'm skipping around. It doesn't matter. You've seen all the tweets, right? He's got this one. Everybody's done this. Uh, yes, Vince allegedly shot his shot. Used his power to shoot his shots. Trying to take his little hits uh, this week. With, with all due respect, uh, The Undertaker and John Cena, right? That was the coldest one. He's talking about fucking how they were, you know, never... The first time they were ever under a million was up against AEW. He's trying to pull literally anything he can out of the blue. To And somebody had made the point, I don't remember who I was listening to, but somebody had said, yeah, you could flip that around. I think it was Cornette. Somebody said, you know, by that logic, you could flip it around and say, well, this was Edge's lowest rated fucking time. on. I think it was Cornette that said that. So Tony Khan continues, and now he's saying that it's uh, it's his fucking mom, you know. This is my mom, and uh, she was the reason that it made it personal. His mom in the Mayo Clinic, God bless her, not knocking her, not, not going to be that guy, but apparently there's a lot of those guys on the interwebs, a lot of people taking jabs at Tony, taking jabs at his mom. He's under a lot of heat and a lot of stress. And I think it was also possibly Cornette or maybe Brian Last who had said that maybe, you know, it's because of his family. Maybe the health issues. Maybe he's cracking due to other things. But his tweets are getting away with him again. He's making an ass of himself online. Even Rene Dupree, who nobody cares about. 
Even he's talking about that. Everybody and their mom's got a fucking video. That's why I said, you've seen all the tweets. I'm just adding to them. You've seen everybody else do that and do it probably better. Everybody's got their comments. Oh, Tony's going insane. Blah, 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 blah. Perhaps. Perhaps he is. Rene Dupree has some advice for him if he is going insane. Check out this clip from his Café de René. De la Dene. Café de la René. Something like that. Check this out. This business can fuck with your head mentally. Do you agree, Jason? Yeah. To say the least. To say the least. Tony's in a position where he's dealing with the biggest money contracts, I think, in history as far as professional wrestling. Yeah, well said. The biggest numbers, uh, biggest names, excuse me. He's going up against the biggest promotion. He's got to learn to control his emotions. (laughs) With social media the way it is today, if he lets it get to him, he could wind up in a fucking mental institution. Okay? I'm serious. I'm yeah, serious. Well, I've it's seen true. it. It's I've true. I've, it. I've I've lived it. It's true. Right. <laughs> right? And we're, we're we're laughing and stuff, but it's fucking dead serious. Get some better lighting and sit up in your chair, dickhead. I don't like Rene Dupree. I think he's a smug fuck. Every once in a while, they have good conversations on his show. I do drop in from time to time, as it is my job, to find all the best clips from all the top podcasts and some of the not-so-top podcasts. Hey, myself included, what are we talking about here? But even Rene Dupree had advice for Tony Khan. And it's some real advice. He's like, no, I'm serious. This shit will drive you crazy. Is Tony Khan going crazy? He might be. Uh, But it just continues to get worse for Tony Khan. Uh, I did try to scroll more and find the exact tweets, but I I mean, I'm not getting lost in all that madness. Uh, But it was reported on, I had first heard it with, uh, on Jim Cornette's drive-thru podcast this week that uh, Tony Khan had gotten into it with another fan online this time. Uh, involving the storyline, the sensitive topic storyline that occurred between Juice Robinson and MJF on Dynamite this week, uh, which appeared to be in pretty poor taste considering what's going on over in other parts of the world currently. So that's a very divisive, hot topic going on right now, and it was probably not a good idea to put that on the show and... Check out this clip uh, as Cornette obviously is going to explain it much better than I will from the Jim Cornette's drive through And we'll catch you on the other side of that. And a fan had tweeted about that, essentially, and Tony Khan had inboxed this motherfucker and was like, hey, and explained it to him, uh, kind of called him out like, hey, bro, I got your point after like the fifth tweet or whatever. And uh, the dude went public with that. There's a Twitter user named Travis Akers, or Ackers, I'm not exactly sure. He retweeted a TMZ article, AEW criticized for running anti-Semitic storyline amid war in Israel. And he said, We were watching AEW when this happened live last night. It was tasteless and a horrible decision by Tony Khan to pursue an angle woven with anti-Semitism. We changed the channel. AEW lost me as a fan with this one, which sucks because I really enjoyed their product. I felt similar to that too, so I understand. But Tony Khan jumped into Travis's DMs. <laughs> I got the point that you didn't like the angle on the second tweet, Travis. Message was received hours ago. I don't think quote tweeting TMZ is doing much good. And then Travis responded, How often do you slide into a fan's DMs to mock a legitimate critique? (laughs) Heels have to be able to offend people to be heels, but not in this timing. 
Yeah, you couldn't use the, the you couldn't use the quarters at all right now because M- no. MJF introduced the quarters into this lexicon of AEW with the anti-Semitic story, the story being bullied. He's told it a couple times. So any usage of the quarters here, no matter what it was, was going to take everyone back to that. The role of quarters didn't even say MJF. Friedman. Yeah, it's a Friedman. Who's ever called him Friedman on that show? No, no one. one. Apparently, Juice Robinson has been using the role of quarters for years. Now, you wouldn't know that if you're watching AEW. AEW? That's my point. So anyone who's saying, well, this clearly is just tying back not to MJF's thing, but the Juice's thing. How would anyone watching this show know that? The only thing you know is MJF's quarter story. No one else is talking about fucking quarters in wrestling. The point is, it just, it was one dimensional. It was obvious what they were doing. It was in bad taste because of the timing. You know, because of, you know, people actually getting killed. And it just, and, and every, nobody along that chain of command thought, eh, maybe the, the quarters is too much. That's the problem. Yeah, that's not great. That's a, that's a bad judgment call on the part of Tony Khan. Uh, I think Tony Khan needs a break. That's what I think. I think he needs a vacation. I think he needs to step down as the fucking booker. He needs to Vince McMahon himself. Be the decider, not the fucking creator. Hire people to create and then just say, nope, 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 yes, yes. Mix those two. Do this instead of that. But yes, be that guy. Instead, he wants to fucking play with his action figures, you know? I mean, he's making an ass of himself. And, uh, you know, this coming off of all the shit that he was previously just went through with CM Punk. And uh, this week he did an interview where he was asked about this. This was with the, let me get this name right here, Dan Lebitard. Lebitard, Lebitard is a ESPN host. I don't know much about him. So uh, he's either a, is on ESPN or recently left ESPN. Uh, but he's got a what appears to be a dope little show, a uh, Pat McAfee esque, I guess. You know, he's got a group of boys sitting around. There's a bunch of people, and they interviewed Tony Khan, and uh, Tony Khan fell into his same old bag of tricks, the same old uh, dodging every question like a fucking dirty politician, only with a nerdy stutter, and it just tiptoeing around everything and then weaving it back into promoting this big show we got going on tonight and for the first time ever i mean look uh ariel hawani did a really good job of kind of trying to press tony before if you remember that whole interview debacle where tony did the same thing but these guys just kind of unleashed or like tony shut stop it you got your plug in answer the fucking question this was great this was brilliant check out this clip at that show you guys managed to put on the biggest show in wrestling history at wembley stadium but you were dealing with a nightmare scenario backstage as one of your performers got into a fight with another one of your performers you've come out and publicly said something happened back there where you feared for your life and this is all surrounding phil knight aka cm punk who's now no longer with the company i know that there's a lot of specifics that maybe you can't get into no get into the specifics (laughs) i want to talk about the managing that scenario it flashing before your eyes, oh my God, this is happening right now, and having to put on a show as one of your top performers, top build performers, a star that was on all the marquees, has lunged towards you in a threatening manner. Well, I don't really want to talk about it, but I will say that I was really glad that the event came out as one of the best shows I've ever seen in pro wrestling. It was over 81,000 tickets sold, 81,035 tickets exactly. And the crowd was amazing, the show was amazing, and the wrestling was amazing. Everybody who wrestled on the show from start to finish did a great job. The fans were behind it. It was one of the biggest pay-per-views we've ever done. And we set huge uh, milestones, really, that this company 
is all about that really when AEW began, it began as a love letter to pro wrestling for the fans. We had never gone to Europe and done a show. We debuted there with one of the biggest wrestling events in the history of the world. And yes, it was a challenging day backstage uh, without getting into the specifics. It was a hard day, but when the show was over, I think we were all really proud and everybody held their head high that this is one of the best wrestling shows anybody's ever done. And AEW were the ones that did it. I'm going to tag in Dan real quick so he can actually get like the real news making answer after I apologize for making <laughs> CM Punk the inventor of Nike. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fine. A, yeah. a punk move by Tony. He <laughs> asked you a question and you've been at the fight game a long time. A total non-answer at the beginning and then just unrelenting promotion because you're a dirty fight game promoter and you didn't come. You know, close. there's a lot. There's people doing a lot worse stuff in the fight game. than. You're right, Tony. You, no, I got to say, like, it's a book. It's a bu- look, no, that was bu- it's bull. It, there, something happened. I want to know what happened back there. What happened back what there? Happened? Don't tell. Don't give Did us. Phil I, Brooks attack I, you. I can't talk about it. What is that? You're. I came on. You came on, and I'm like, this guy always answers the questions. You honestly. said you feared for your life. You promoted How? this thing a couple of different times. All right, you got your promotion on. It's tonight. You got a rating. I'm glued floor. to Title Tuesday. Give me some of the good Did shit. Did he throw a punch at what you? What happened back there? I have not really gone out and discussed that publicly beyond what I said in Chicago. I had to make a really hard decision after what happened. And I really appreciate all the fans standing by us and supporting AEW through this. And we're having uh, a huge show tonight. And like I said, I am promoting tonight's show, but I also am not saying anything that I haven't said before. Well, that's, Why not? I, that's useless. But we're Say special. It. We Say it to us. Whisper it to us. Tony, stay strong. Did we he need, punch you with guys, the left or right hand? Did he make contact? You haven't said before. <laughs> Did you need an ice pack? Do you not understand how promotion works? Something, we don't want the same things you've said before. We want a little bit extra. Just give us a little something. Okay. Who wins okay. tonight? Well, that's a good question. About Damn it, Billy. He was getting yeah. there. <laughs> See, I really appreciate you giving me that out. Uh, Damn it, Billy. He was getting there. He said okay. That from the Dan Lebitard show. Again, uh, link down in the description for all of these clips. And Tony Khan was hard pressed. But look, he kept his smile. He kept his composure. He didn't like yell or push back or take an attitude with them like he might have with an Ariel Hawani, for example couple of nerds nerding at each other, though I think Ariel would just beat the sh- dog shit out of Tony Khan. Still a couple of nerds nerding at each other, but uh, Tony did get a lot of pushback here, and he still danced around it and gave non-answers. Uh, but for more insight of, you know, what's it like working with a crazy weirdo guy like this? And do people take advantage of him? Matt Hardy was talking about Tony Khan. His boss. Now, mind you, Tony Khan is the guy that pays Matt Hardy. He writes his checks for him. So keep that all into consideration with these answers. Uh, But John Alba on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast was kind of asking Matt all the interesting questions. I wouldn't say tough questions, but Alba wasn't afraid to kind of ask questions like, do people take advantage of Tony Khan? Uh, and and I say this so wholeheartedly, and I know the the losers out there will say, "Oh, look, look at this Mark, all this stuff." I, I find Tony Khan to be a, a very genuine person. You know, is can he be a lot to handle sometimes? Certainly so. We we are seeing it this week on social media, right? Um, but I find him to be a very genuine, good human being, and I have many examples to fall back on personally, as far as that's concerned. And then you see the examples that are expressed by other wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Does he have that good naturedness and vulnerability perhaps taken advantage of at times by talent or people in the industry? Yes. I mean, I I think it has happened in the past for sure. Uh, But, you know, I, I think once you go through those experiences, you learn from them. And I think Tony has done that. I mean, he's, he's learning on the fly. This whole thing is like, It's a huge, huge responsibility to be a wrestling promoter, booker, run a company, especially with all the other stuff he has going on. So, yeah, he's he's learning on the job while he's doing it. And I'm I'm sure there's been people that have taken advantage of his kindness, uh, but he 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 will continue to to learn and grow and he will 
he will be able to get past that, I'm sure, going forward. So to kind of put a bow on all of this with my thoughts here, I think Tony Khan needs a break. Dude needs to go on vacation. He needs a writer's Here's what he needs. Don't hire writers. I would hi- actually I would hire a writer, maybe two, uh, like Hollywood style writers, but really just kind of have them in the room to have that like for story structure purposes. Because as good as say like if they were to bring Matt Hardy into the creative room, uh, he might not know the exact way that a TV could be structured or should be structured or a storyline beats that spread out over multiple shows. Bring in writers from like soap operas that really know how to drag shit out. You ever watch a soap opera? Those motherfuckers will do a story that la- they have to do a new episode every single day. So they will literally just have an episode where they're just sitting in a room and having a conversation, but it moves the plot just a hair. And over time, you get the big angles and the big reveals and the big twists and stuff, but you really build up to them. And I think, you know, you don't want to do it, obviously not daily, but look, they have three shows. Not everybody needs to be on every show, but if you get a couple writers, one for every show even perhaps, just to kind of sit in the room for the story arcs, right? Then you got to hire, you got you bring in a creative team from people that know the business better than Matt, uh, better than Tony Khan does. And that was a little bit of a slip there because uh, following that clip from Matt Hardy, I think Matt Hardy would be one person I would bring in. He's a creative mind. He gets the, he comes from the old school and he, he lives through the, he was a, a megastar in the Attitude Era, but he also seems to, have a better understanding of what today's generation is trying, you know, he's more likely to understand an Orange Cassidy and a Young Bucks and these type of performers. Dan Housen, you know what I mean? Like Hardy kind of gets that. I would also try to bring in an old, older school guy that did a lot of booking and shit for like Puerto Rico, like Dutch Mantel. I would try to pull in Dutch, uh, you know, an old wily vet. I know Tony tried to acquire Jim Cornette at one point. Uh, that was a smart move. Obviously, Corny didn't want to work there, but get a wily old vet. My next choice would be Dutch, but somebody like that who can come in and contribute from an old school perspective. Get somebody from the younger crowd, somebody really young. Even like an Orange Cassidy, perhaps, um, if he's got a creative mind or somebody from that modern group. Okay, then you want to bring in, oh, I don't know, here on the spot. You know what I mean? You want to you want to have a wide variety is what I'm getting. Have an old school guy, have a modern guy, have a couple different kind of creative brains People that would be really smart to the business and especially smart to the business in their eras and have those different perspectives and bring those brains into your creative circle and have them kick around story ideas and you just sit there and fucking decide. You can fucking put them to work and Come up with a Jimmy Jacobs would be another fantastic. He already works there and uh, he's already supposedly on that inner circle. He needs to make this official, have his little round table, have them come up with shit and then he can decide he can veto, you know, and, and, and try it like that for a while. Because what Tony's doing now is he's running around with his notebook and he's, and look, he's a good matchmaker. He could, and I've even said before, he could still make the matches, but not the storylines. He could say, this is where I want for the pay-per-view. Here's a match I'd like on Dynamite. Here's a match I'd like on Collision. Here's this, this, and that. You know, he could give them his little notes. They could be a, a skeleton, if you will. Not even a fucking story arc or anything. Just his, because that's all he's doing is going, I, uh, this match versus this match would be, would be sweet. And, and then his storyline is, is, is non-existent unless the people involved in the story 
are are have creative minds and then they can contribute their own ideas to it. Darby Allen, very creative guy. Bring him in. He's he could be that current younger guy. I was talking about that could come in instead of like an Orange Cassidy, perhaps somebody along those lines. Have them come up with the stories, flesh out the stories, and you can oversee it. Have a meeting every week, every couple of weeks, whatever. Tweak things as you go. Try it, man. You're burning yourself out. Jeff Jarrett. Bring in Jeff Jarrett. There you go. Fuck Dutch Mantel. Not fuck Dutch Mantel, but bring in Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Har- Jarrett, Matt Hardy, they already all work there. Jimmy Jacobs already works there. Darby or Orange, somebody on the young side that already works there. Yourself. And fucking have them come up with the stuff for you. Have somebody book Ring of Honor completely separate all by itself. Maybe that's like a Chris Hero job, right? I guess he's involved. Oh, here all these people are involved with these things, but what are they actually doing? I'm not seeing a lot of change in the creative. That's the thing. That's the problem. It's the creative. Creative is the problem with AEW right now. You Nobody wants to see the shit. When they come to your town, the, the seats are empty. That's a problem. Why are the seats empty? The seats are empty because there's no reason that people don't want to will want to go. And it's not that they don't have all the star power in the world. They have every big star that WWE doesn't. And they have access to more if they want to get more. That's not the problem. The problem is what are they doing? What's compelling about it? What are you excited to see? When I went... I was excited to see, I've been to two AEW shows, and it was CM Punk's return, his very first return, the original, the first dance, like on the second rampage ever in Chicago, was at that, and then I was at Blood and Guts in Detroit, both fantastic shows, fantastic, top to bottom, awesome shows, spectacles, but that was the draw, I wanted to see Punk return. That was a story. That was a star. That was something that I wanted to go see. I needed to go see. I wouldn't have gone there to go see, you know, Darby Russell fucking uh, whoever. You know what I mean? So they needed that. And then the blood and guts, obviously, that's a huge spectacle. Of course, I want to go see that. So... Not that they got a hot shot every show and do gimmick matches and stuff, but what they got to make you excited to see that product. They got to make the product hot. They need to bring in more creative minds. I think the problem is it's just still Tony Khan deciding everything. I don't know what these other guys are doing behind the scenes, but it does not appear that anything's changing. And yes, I'm interested in things like the Edge storyline. I thought that was good. Him and Christian, right? That's fine. That's good. It's good shit. Christian tells him to go fuck himself. I love that. Great work. Christian's such a great heel. Dude has a fucking six pack and wears a turtleneck. It's great. He's such a heel. But not everybody has that because not everybody's creative or has Tony's. They're not main event stars. Brian Danielson, one of the biggest stars in the entire world, right? WrestleMania 30, it was him holding up two belts, defeated everybody. Meh. He's just meh. He's just meh because he's tied up in the Blackpool Combat Club, which way overstayed its welcome, which also buried Claudio, which also buried Moxley. All of these guys should be individual stars. Look, you didn't tune in to hear me rebook the entire territory. Matter of fact, that could be a whole separate video. How to fix AEW. Who knows? I don't fucking know. But the point is, Tony Khan's slipping. He's losing his shit. All right? He's fucking losing it. He's overbooked, overstretched. He's exhausted. He should not be on Twitter while he's exhausted. I'm not for censorship. I'm not saying he needs an intervention, but he might need an intervention. Chill the fuck out, bro. 
It's like when you break up with your girlfriend and you're heartbroken. The last thing you want to do is go on fucking Facebook or Twitter or whatever and go, you fuck yeah, I was with you for 10 years. Hey, you cheated on me with him. And you're on this fucking rant for like five, six, tw- stop tweeting. You're embarrassing yourself. I'll leave it at that, though, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Are you team Tony Khan? Is he justified in what he's doing? Is he making a dork of himself, an ass of himself? Is he ruining AEW? Is he overstretched on the booking? Does he need to hire somebody else to do his booking for him or multiple somebody else's? Did you like my creative team that I would string together from the AEW roster already employed? Is there anybody else that you would bring in or add to or switch out? Who's your creative team? If you could put it together, let me know all of that shit down in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button while you're there like it or some shit, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. By the way, that meme over there, isn't that shit dope? Isn't that shit dope? You got to give me a little bit of I'm for hire. You can pay me. Hit me up. I'll fucking, I'll do you up, bro. It's just hot. Well, for the first time ever, CM Punk's stock seems to be at an all-time low. This as news has come out that he was denied access back into the WWE. This reported by Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer, our favorite dirt sheet writer extraordinaire, right? The dirt sheet godfather, if you will. The same guy who had reported that CM Punk was in talks with WWE to begin with. Or was he? I have my thoughts on this. But first, before we do that, check out this clip from the boys over at What Culture Wrestling. Those blokes. As they talk about the big news of CM Punk. Turned down for a return to the WWE. Check out this clip. WWE has turned down CM Punk. Wow. What a development this is in the ongoing saga. I'm going to read the exact quote from Wrestling Observer Radio so there's no doubt in anybody's mind as to what was said. Dave Meltzer, here he goes. They turned him down. He wanted to go there and the decision was a no. It can always change and it was brought up to me. There's no such thing as no forever when it comes to WWE, but it's no for now. That was the decision that was made. It was Vince's decision. Vince, Nick Khan, and Paul Levesque, obviously they decided the negatives outweighed the positives. So it's the latest twist in the saga. Dave had reported himself last week that that, that there'd been some kind of talks. Punk wanted to go back to WWE Mm -hmm. since being fired from AEW with cause in early September, Uh, but no deal was done. I think that Dave's report got conflated a little bit and uh, people were like, that's definitely happening in Survivor Series. Yeah, they put it all together because Survivor Series yeah. in Chicago. When really what he said in his write-up was Survivor Series would make sense. I call bullshit on this one. I think Dave Meltzer's full of shit. He was the one who reported that CM Punk was in talks with WWE. How the fuck does he know? He was on the Young Bucks side, Remember? He wasn't getting shit. He was the one. CM Punk was pissed at Dave Meltzer. I highly doubt he's getting information from Punk's side. Are there people in the WWE leaking information to Dave Meltzer that CM Punk is in negotiations with them? Well, if you listen to Sean Ross Sapp over at Fightful, who is credible as fuck, who doesn't have all of the shady stories and shady theories, and shady this and that write-ups that Dave Meltzer has, Sean Ross Sapp has a little bit of a different perspective on this. Check out this clip. The other day, I had debunked a fake Twitter scoopster that said, CM Punk is signed to a one-year, $11 million contract. I said, this is completely false. 
I got a call from a WWE higher up unprompted, unprompted. And they said, CM Punk not only is not signed by AEW, we are not are not signed by WWE. WWE. We are not in negotiations with CM Punk. Now, if it, I had somebody say, can you give me a little hope? If you want a little bit of hope, it is that CM Punk himself made that offhand comment saying, in two months, I'm free as a bird, yada, yada. And if, for some reason, he's under a non-compete, then, of course, WWE can't negotiate with him. However, top talent, and Jimmy knows who this top talent are. Is it safe to say, Jimmy, that WWE is not going to lie or risk alienating these top talents? 100%. 100%. We're outright told he ain't coming in. They're not planning on it. It's not happening. That's what these top talent were outright told because uh, I don't just hear from a a top person in WWE and the top talent and just run with it. I follow up. I followed up with people close to Punk. And people close to Punk said, yeah, the conversations haven't happened. Now, two weeks ago, I had reported that Punk had either, or at least one of his friends had been sort of a feeler asking how should this be approached and that he was told should probably just be Vince McMahon. You should probably reach out to him. However, things have changed at least creatively in just the last two weeks, which is another story that we went in the weeds on, on fightfulselect.com best $5 in the business. Now, now I, I want to make this clear and, and clip it. Kyler's going to clip it so I can say this as of October 10th, this is how things are going to go. I do not know how things are going to go in November, December, January. It's wrestling. Anything can happen. Ultimate Warrior got a ton of shots, and he was batshit crazy. Another one is, well, of course, they're trying to keep the surprise. No, specifically in that call, I was told that they did not want to set unrealistic expectations for fans watching or going to the show. Now, so as of right now, CM Punk is not and has not been in talks with WWE and fans should lower their expectations for the Survivor Series. And Sean Ross Sapp went on to say that this is not like a, oh, we're working the dirt sheet situation. If he's on to something, they either will outright say, nope, you're completely wrong. You should probably stop reporting this and stirring shit up. Or they ignore him completely. They don't feed him bullshit. They don't mislead. They just fucking ignore it. Black it out. Try to keep it tight-lipped. And that's how he knows that there's more there to dig into. Every once in a while, yes, people will drop him, obviously, but... For the most part, that's how it works. You know, he was very specific about that to say that this information coming from WWE seems to be 100% legit from a high up there. Who could that be? Bruce Prichard? Probably not Triple H himself. William Regal? He's in the inner circle. Who knows? Nick Khan himself could be reaching out to Fightful. I don't know, but he said somebody high up in WWE themselves reached out to him directly to say no that's not a thing <clears throat> so it leads me to wonder is dave Meltzer just making up his own stories for press he's the one reporting that cm punk is in talks with wwe now he's the one reporting in the next issue that cm punk was rejected by wwe is he booking his own storylines for the Wrestling Observer? Sean Ross Sapp's information from a high up within WWE wanted to be very clear that they are not, were not, and do not intend to be anytime soon in talks with CM Punk. Do not get your hopes up for Survivor Series. You will be let down. Of course, we all know, as the wrestling marks, that we are, that... Because CM Punk said, I'm free till about, you know, for the next two months, which brings us to November. That CM Punk to WWE confirmed and all the fans in Chicago are going to be going, CM Punk, CM Punk. See, you know it's going to happen. Now, could this be one of those things where the stir is so great 
that they go out and they try to acquire Punk like they tried to do with Sting back when The Undertaker was going to return and they everybody thought it was Sting. Perhaps. And maybe it's partially true that, you know, that they just told Punk that they weren't interested, that there were feelers sent out and that Punk was told no, or that they told said they were not interested in Punk. It just seems to be two completely different stories. And on one hand, you got Meltzer who fibs stuff from time to time. And, and here's the thing with Meltzer, if you listen to him talk long enough, as I do, I listen to a lot of his podcasts or, you know, Wrestling Observer Radio or whatever the fuck. This guy built books his own storylines in his head. You can hear him talking outright. He'll get asked about something and he'll be like, you know, because probably, uh, you know, my guess is that he'll probably and then, you know, because he wouldn't do that. And and he wouldn't do that because that would be he Meltzer invents stuff based on what he thinks he knows. And he reports this as accurate. A guy like a Sean Ross Sapp, who for my money, just from an outside perspective, is the fucking the top notch guy you need to be tuning into for your wrestling dirt. He's, you know, batting a thousand, basically. You know what I mean? He doesn't have this kind of track record of fucking this kind of shit up. Uh, I believe I tend to believe his side of it, but who knows? Who knows what exactly is going on here? I don't know that WWE needs to bring in CM Punk. They got all those hints. That's the other thing, right? Seth Rollins is out there saying he's the best in the world. Corey Graves is t- cutting the the greatest trick the devil ever did was make you think he's not real promo. And, uh, you know, Nakamura's dropping GTSs and everybody's fucking, oh, my God, CM Punk, he's coming back, of course. Maybe. Maybe he will. Um, you know, Endeavor, obviously, TKO. Punk's got that history with UFC. Not a great history, but he's got a history with UFC, and he's friendly with them on their side. Maybe, you know, Ari Emanuel would see a CM Punk as a, as a former UFC guy and go, that could be a good call to bring him in. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it bringing CM Punk in. You know, a lot of people were talking about that. that, You know, Punk's, is he going to make that big of a difference in the numbers and everything for WWE to make it worth the headaches that he's going to cause? That's the other thing that Sean Ross Sapp is saying is that the talent are all being told no. Talent that have specifically asked, hey, is it true? Are the rumors true? Tell me, is it true? Say it isn't so. And WWE is telling these top talent, no, it's not true. Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. So are they kayfabing their top talent? And and Sean Ross Sapp made it very, made it clear to specifically say that these were top talent that WWE is not going to just want to be in the habit of kayfabing and fucking with the heads of, right? They could be, but, you know, for example, Roman Reigns. I don't think it's a Roman Reigns, but even Seth Rollins perhaps might be a good pick for that. To just outright, you know, if he's like, hey, you bringing that fucker in here? I don't like Phil. Maybe, you know, and they're like, no. No. We're not bringing them in. Promise. Pinky swear. There's a lot of mixed reporting going on. And I tend to believe Sean Ross sat, but maybe Meltzer is on to something. Maybe there was something going on there. Whatever it is, it appears to be dead now. So what happens with CM Punk from here? Where does he go? What does he do? Does he retire from the world of pro wrestling? Does he go to New Japan? New Japan Strong, Impact Wrestling, CMLL, sign with fucking Conan. What does CM Punk, maybe he's the top star for Freddie Prince Jr.'s 
gimmick that he's coming out with. I don't know how big of a promotion that's going to be, but he's doing it. Maybe Punk's his guy there. He could probably make a pretty big splash if it is. This is going to be interesting. I don't know that Punk, maybe Punk ends up back in AEW. Maybe a year or so down the line, he does end up going back to WWE because they need something big for WrestleMania or something or whatever. Who knows? It's pro wrestling. We've all learned and we should all know by now. Never say never. Nothing is a no. It's only a no for now. Nothing is out of the question. But for now, it appears to be dead. Let me know your thoughts down below, though. I'm curious. Where do you want to see CM Punk? Do you want to see CM Punk? Are you one of the people that fuck CM Punk? Get him out of here. Good riddance. Glad you're gone. Or are there people that, hey, man, he should do Impact. Do you think he'll even do a lower level fucking promotion like an Impact? Or, you know, anything, even a New Japan, maybe a New Japan, I would lower myself to that at worst. But now Punk's got to be over in Japan. What if there's another Pandy that happens? And he's got to be stuck there, can't go there. Is he going to get paid as much? His stock has fell. He is not worth what he was worth. At one point, look, CM Punk coming up in the indies was a hot product right off the bat because he's putting on good indie shows. His matches with Colt Cabana was Colt Cabana. That Colt Cabana, Colt Cabana, were infamous. And they were promoters were buying that match, essentially, booking them to face each other all around the loop on the indies, everywhere they could get a match in. Ring of Honor, he made a name for himself there. He was in demand. He signs with WWE. For WWE, the fan support behind CM Punk in 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 a guy like uh like a Paul Heyman behind him rose him up to the point where he was fans were fans needed him in WWE. They demanded it on the main roster. Started in ECW, but quickly moved to SmackDown and everything else. And that propelled, he just up and up and up, right up to the WWE Championship with C, with John Cena. And the, the Summer of Punk that they were doing there, which they could have done a much better job of. We could go into that at another time. And then when CM Punk left the WWE, He wasn't even on the decline there. He was still hot as hell. And then he was gone for seven years. And then for him to come back when he came back to WWE, people were, or to AEW, people were chanting Punk's name for seven years. It never stopped. They needed this man in their life. And then he comes back to AEW and he slowly, methodically ruins his entire legacy. Now, you could blame that on AEW. Can't blame it on their booking, though. Punk, arguably, was probably the best booked in the entire fucking company. He had great feuds, great stories, won the fucking world title twice, beat top stars, worked with young talent, tagged with CMF, fucking CMFTR got to be a thing, tagged with Sting, main evented big. Pay-per-views, wrestled in Wembley Stadium. You can't say that he had a bad run. Samoa Joe, MJF. It was a good run. Injuries aside, Moxley. Never got to work with Kenny or the Bucks, but, you know, that would have been fucking dope to see, especially after said incident. So it wasn't the booking. Maybe it was the promotion. Well, you know. They could have always promoted harder that Punk was there, perhaps. But it was Punk's big fat fucking mouth and ego that was getting him in trouble. That was ruining it with the fans. It was that press conference. It was the rumors coming out from backstage. Maybe a lot of that was the Bucks trying to smear and and, and ruin Punk. We've heard a lot of that from the punk from the Bucks that they're 
You know, that's kind of their ammo is to leak dirty shit to the dirt sheets to kind of paint people in bad pictures that they don't like. So maybe they were burying Punk behind the scenes and sabotaging him. Or, you know, maybe it's a mix of both. Maybe Punk's big fat mouth and bad attitude came from the Bucks trying to sabotage him backstage. Obviously, that hangman thing. And the Colt Cabana thing were both uncalled for. And your punk, Punk's not a bear that you're going to poke. He's going to fucking paw at you with his fucking... He's going to swipe your fucking head off. Punk's a wild animal. Don't poke that bear. He'll fight you. He'll come at you. Verbally, physically, all of it. But then Punk takes it too far. He goes scorched earth. That press conference and then the fight backstage was like... There was zero respect for AEW as a company. Tony Khan sitting right next to him. Fuck him. Who cares? I'm on a rant here. I'm going to eat my fucking muffins and bury the entire company. That's where he went too far where people are like, wow, this guy, the fucking ego on this guy, the attitude, the self-righteousness, the conviction in which he's the fucking the superiority factor all of it the i'm better than you you know i don't think he's it's always been his thing right straight edge means i'm better than you long before mjf was doing it and then when he came back again now he's fighting people backstage again and having all these incidences and being a dick backstage in collision and telling people they can't fucking play in his playground and shit in the modern era where everybody's touchy and sensitive and doesn't like mean angry violent bitchy people to begin with punk's punk wasn't gonna fit in anyway no matter how many times he wanted to go out and praise trans kids rights those people were still gonna have hurt feelings over his words (laughs) so punk Buried himself every chance he got into, you know, it's a mix of today's modern era not being a good fit for him. It's a mix of, a, a you know, maybe a la- little bit of a lack of promotion. And then, but Punk, and obviously I think the Young Bucks were pushing him backstage. But at the end of the day, Punk's ego in his big mouth got him where he is now, which is shit out of luck. In both companies. He was the anti-hero when he left WWE because it was for a cause. And AEW was the anti-WWE company. It was a perfect fit. He's the perfect icon for that company. To lead it. To lead that charge as, to, as the number two. But we quickly found out that CM Punk was always in it for CM Punk. Which is what Triple H had said in that promo. He was right. Appears to be anyway, right? You don't want a revolution. You want what's best for you, for Phil. That's what that's what he's really fighting for. It's sad. It's sad because I was, was, is, am, I don't know, a huge CM Punk fan. And a lot of other people are and were and are confused about it too. Like a lot of people are confused about their genders. A lot of people are confused about whether they're CM Punk fans or not. I get it. I understand. But Punk is kind of shit out of luck now. He can keep going lower down the card. I'm sure Impact would love to have him. They're not going to be able to afford him. Unless he just fucking lowers his value. If he wants to keep wrestling, he could go to New Japan. Where he, I, he always said he wanted to wrestle in Japan anyway. Working for New Japan proper along with fucking Mercedes, who I think is probably going to AEW anyway too. Could be the next step for Punk and probably the next logical step because it's the next biggest promotion. Maybe that's the move to make. Other than that, I can't see him even, maybe Freddie Prince Jr. can kick off his company with a huge bang while it was signing Dolph Ziggler and CM Punk and you know maybe he can move in and be like wow I can really uh kind of up the value of this new promotion I'm 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 trying to launch here with some big name talent but I think that would lower the value of Punk 
I don't know. I think I, it's a big mess. I, maybe he just rides off into the sunset. And, uh, you know, he's the textbook perfect example of you either die the hero or you live long enough to become the villain. That's the story of CM Punk's career in a nutshell. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I've gone on this long enough. While you're there, hit that subscribe button, like it or some shit. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. The rated R superstar Ed, it, <clears throat> Adam Copeland was on the Talk is Jericho podcast. Talking with Jericho. Talking with Chris Jericho. Doing the obligatory, I just left WWE and now I'm in AEW and I'm doing my first official podcast and telling my story interview with Chris Jericho that he always seems to get. Next stop will be AEW Unrestricted and then fucking Rampage, right? But he was on Talk is Jericho and him and Chris are old friends. So they were just kind of chatting it up and having a good time. But they got to talking. What led to the decision to move from WWE to AEW? Because it really was a decision that he had to make that he could make. He could have stayed in WWE. Here's what he had to say. There was a list of guys that I wanted to work, and I worked most of them. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of got to a point, I think, you know, I've said, I think both sides were just out of ideas. Right. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's no one's fault. You said you outgrew each other. Yeah. That's a great quote. And, and I, I truly feel like that's kind of the way it was. I, I, I have a small window here to be able to contribute to the wrestling industry as a whole and be able to pull off matches that I want to pull off at a certain level. I know that time frame is small. It's, right. it's not like I got another 10 years left in me uh, it, to do it the way I want to do mm. it. And I wanted to maximize it. And to, to their point, to WWE's point is, you know, well, if you're around too much, it's not special. And I can see that. I get it. I just felt like if I got two years or if I got a year, then let's let's like take the governor off and let's go right, right, right. um that's really all it boiled down to and then i look at it and you know i when i did sit down with my family and talk and my girls made it real simple I just go be with uncle jay <laughs> i mean when, when a nine-year-old can really simplify <laughs> right. something for you like that and just kind of smack you in the face with with like mm -hmm. clearly it's got to be that dad mm -hmm. like what are you thinking right right because for a while like after and during the Toronto show, I was like, God, this might be it, man. But your final show. Yeah, the one in Toronto with, with Shane. Anniversary match. Yeah. yeah. So I, I really took some time to just kind of sit on my butt and and sit with it mm -hmm. and, and see where, where my heart and my brain sometimes have different ideas. And um, I just needed to kind of get through all of that and decide where it was going to be. And again, the girls just really simplified it for me and made it a kind of a no-brainer when they said that mm -hmm. and again back to challenges and, and challenging yourself this is a challenge you know yeah a and and it's not the safe thing mm -hmm. i could have gone with the safe thing and well you know yeah because you did exactly the same thing right. it's um sometimes you just got to do that and you, you step out of a comfort zone and and kind of take the warm blanket off and just see what's out there and it's also like I'm not walking into this site unseen. You're here. Jay's here. FTR's here. Like I have some great friends here yeah. who have all been telling me their, their stories of having fun. And, um, again, at this stage, having fun challenges, getting to work with, you know, my best friend. Mm. I mean, come on. Well, I'm glad that Adam likes a challenge because he certainly walked into one when he came out of the curtain and he hit the one side and did his like this and then he went to the other side and oh, there's no one there. You're still supposed to, you, you still sell it though. Like, hey, I saw you guys way up in the rafters. You know, you pretend you work the crowd. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, oof, it's hard, man. It's hard. Adam Copeland kind of stepping in. It does seem like a bit of a downgrade now, doesn't it? Uh, 
I think I remember saying last time that I was talking when Edge made his debut that, uh, you know, he'd be able to kind of go around the horn and, and pop the business for a little bit. The ratings didn't really show that he's much of a draw and the seats are still a little bit empty. So I, I he's got work to do. It is a challenge. It's a challenge. You're in a whole new company. Now, can you prove that you are a draw? Like that's been a huge criticism of Adam Copeland's for a long time is he's always been a huge star, but not the star. So he's been a top guy, but not the top guy. Still, despite that, I mean, he's won every championship there is to win multiple times. He's won the money in the bank the first time ever. He won the Royal Rumble, I think, twice at least. He's main evented WrestleMania twice at least. Once with The Undertaker, once against uh, Roman and, and Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan at the time. He will always be remembered for the groundbreaking tag team division in the Attitude Era with the TLC matches. You know, I was thinking about this. Like, he's got another Hall of Fame. He's a Hall of Famer. He's already been inducted into the Hall of Fame. He'll get another. He'll be a two-time Hall of Famer. Mark my words, because Edge and Christian are going in as a tag team. Why? Because Christian's not going to go in on his own. At least not yet. Maybe way in the future when they're really hurting for people. But for now, Christian's probably not going in on his own. But he'll go in as a tag team. They're going to be like, who revolutionized the WWE with the TLC ladder match. You know, their little promo packages. And, and they'll come out as, as and they'll strike their poses on the podium and stuff like that. For the benefit of those with flash photography. You guys, any of you kids watching even know what flash photography is at this point? Some say that wrestling was better back in the day because you could get the scenes of the crowd, the people in the crowd, where you could see the flashes going off in the crowd when big moves happen and stuff. Times have changed. Times have changed. We're in a different time. So Edge, his career set. He's done everything he has. This is kind of a step down, right? Like... This guy that main evented with The Undertaker for the world title and was even pitched to be the guy. Remember that? I covered it here on this show. Under Out of The Undertaker's words himself, Vince McMahon pitched that Edge was the guy to end The Undertaker's streak. He could have been that guy. Probably should have been. That would have been another huge bonus to Tony Khan, wouldn't it? Especially now, since it went to Brock. Brock. I mean, Edge turned it down because he thought it should have went to some young up-and-comer who needed it, like a Roman, who wasn't even around at the time, you know, like Roman would have became. Said they gave it to Barack Lesnar. It was believable, but eh, who needs it, right? He's got an uphill battle. He's got a lot of work to do. I think his storyline's really good. I think the work he's doing with Christian is great right now. I think it's compelling. It really is. Uh, they had me hooked as soon as Christian hugged him and then said, go fuck yourself. I was in. I was in. Because he didn't, you know, there was no attack. He walked away. There's no conf confrontation. And uh, Adam did say in this interview with Chris that he believes that a long-term story can still be told, that he believes in long-term stories. And he also said that it was he needed to do his first story with Christian that the fans would have been like, why, how could you come into this company and not be involved with Christian in some way, shape or form? You have to, right? You kind of got to. So as long as they don't fucking try to do a TLC match against the Hardy boys, I think we'll be, you know, you're fine, but they could do a whole story arc. They could do a whole thing like The Undertaker did with Kane where, like, they teamed up for a little bit and then they had a fallout again. Uh, you know, before they actually have their match, they could end up doing I'm not going to say here in Fantasy Book, but you get the point. They could do a really long, drawn-out thing, and it seems to be that's where he wants to go. And more power to him. It's an uphill battle. He is now tasked with replacing Punk with being a guy who can draw. He needs to be a game changer for AEW. I think it's a one-two punch, though, because I think Punk was a heavy hitter. 
and Jade was a really strong character. And, and regardless of her value in AEW at the time, she's ten times the value in WWE now, right? Especially the way they parade her around with everybody. There's that picture floating around of uh, her, uh, Paul Heyman, standing behind her. Oh, my God. He's looking at her like, Jesus Christ, this girl's money. You know what I mean? And then that face-to-face with Charlotte on SmackDown. My God. They know what they're doing. They're parading her around everywhere. As this big fucking deal, giving her face to faces with everybody, getting all the pops, getting all the what could be. I actually like that introduction. I actually like that. I, you know, I was a little sad when on Fastlane when her her debut was to be backstage. I thought that was really stupid. She, you know, I would have had her come out and interrupt somebody or would have made a big debut on on a big show. But I, you know what? They are actually making her look like a big star. She's walking around with all the fucking management. They're giving her the grand tour. Sean's coming out to her fucking delivery service vehicle and saying, you know, hey, like, uh, you know, very uh, good. pleased to meet you, you know. Her black car service. He's like, hey, uh, we're so glad you're here in NXT. Let me show you around, you know. And she's, I was thinking about her character, too. She's very, uh, she's very, like, high value but she's courteous she's she's like bitchy and got an attitude with maybe chicks but like she's cool with the management you know she's polite and respectful to all of the the higher ups and stuff so they, I, I think they're doing good there a long story right here a long winded going off the rails here so i think uh that when they bring in mercedes monet money when they bring her in to AEW, which seems to be, at least if you believe the dirt sheets, as we all do, seems to be all but a lock as soon as her knee heals or leg or ankle or pinky toe or whatever it was her. Her and Edge could be the difference makers together. That and, uh, you know, Tony needs to stop booking the shows and, and bringing in some creative minds to do that for him. That's what he needs to do. He could even fulfill his creative little booking itch and book for Ring of Honor and then turn over his big shows to a, a bigger team. But that was a story for a different clip. But what do you guys think? Let me know your thoughts down into those comments below. If you could, please. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. I greatly appreciate that, too. Do you think Edge is uh, going to be a difference maker in AEW? Do you think he's a flop in AEW? Do you think he has what it takes to turn that ship around? Is this slowly turning into TNA? Or is this going to be uh, just, you know, uh, are we just ahead of their next big upturn and, and more competition for the WWE? Who knows? It could go any which way. But I want to hear your thoughts in those comments below. Hit the thumbs up while you're there. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. So I saw that the official trailer for the Iron Claw movie, the movie about the Von Erich family, and I think specifically Carrie Von Erich, right? We'll find out here. I saw that they dropped their official trailer. This is the movie that MJF was going to be in, and there's lots of other rumored like co-stars and that sort of thing, and there's going to be a lot of recreations and that kind of thing going on, sort of like they do in Young Rock, but in movie form. Movie form. And they got Zac Efron playing Carrie Von Eric, the beefy hunk. Mm, man meat. So I thought instead of watching the trailer and seeing what it was all about, that I would save it and I would watch it with you guys. So that's what we're here to do. So uh, I'm going to do one of my Seth Grimes reacts, Seth Grimes reaction videos, but I'm going to do it to this Iron Claw trailer. I'm actually super excited to see it. I've been holding out for it to do it live with you guys. I have not seen it. I do not know anything about it. Heard people talk about it, that kind of thing, but that's about it. So let's go ahead and dive on in. Go ahead and hop on over to the other screen here. And we're going to go ahead and hit play 
on the official trailer. Let's go ahead and check this out. Ever since I was a child, people said my family was cursed. Mom tried to protect us with God. Pop tried to protect us with wrestling. He said if we were the toughest, the strongest, nothing could ever hurt us. That's dope. We all did. Fuck yeah. Morning. Pants tomorrow, please, David. Perry, I want you to join your brothers in the ring. Yes, sir. I love that. That's Carrie. Oh, no. Carrie's my favorite, then Kev, then David, then Mike. Oh. Okay. The rankings can always change. What do you want in life? Kevin Von Eric. More ribs. <laughs> I want to be with my family. You know, be with my brothers. What do you like to do with your brothers? The fucking we can do anything. free birds. That's so cool. To the wrestling federation that our father built with his own two hands. Wow. The sportatorium. So what do you think? Like we're alive. I love your family, Kevin. Don't we, Uncle? Yes, sir. Oh, man, that makes me so happy. I talked to you about something. Dad's too tough on us. You gotta say something. Baby, that's what your brothers are for. You feel that? Ah. You feel that? Ah. That's the claw. The iron claw. You're pushing too hard. I'm fine, kid. Seriously, I'm just sick. I'm scared, man. It all my head of control. need to think about my family. Your job is to wrestle. Live up to that deal or we are through. Wow. I just love being out there with you guys. It's the only thing that matters to me. The father will forever be the greatest family in the history of wrestling. Kind of a bonk-ass generic Ric Flair. Wow. That was fucking dope. That looks really good. Like really good. I'm impressed. I am I am thorough call me impressed. I'm thoroughly impressed with how that turned out. Uh it looks good. It looks like they got a story in there that people will bite into where wrestling is just kind of like the backdrop. Wrestling's what these characters do, but the story's about this family. You know, they got the love in there, the baby, the fucking dad, the brothers, the tragedy. I misspoke completely. Holy shit, I thought uh, Carrie, because Carrie's obviously like the most, the one who got reached the highest level out of the Von Eric. Van, Von, bleh, the Von Erics. Jesus Christ, I can't talk today. Carrie was the one who reached the highest level out of the Von Erics, but uh, I guess Kevin is the star of the movie. And then they got the dude from Shameless playing the dude playing Carrie Von Erich, which actually looks the part much better, to be honest. So, fuck, man. This looks really cool. The, I wasn't too impressed with the Ric Flair. I'm excited to see. I almost kind of want to go back in and get closer looks at, like, the Freebirds and stuff. Can we do that? Let's do that here. We yeah, of course we can do that. It's my fucking show. Let's hop back over. Let's see what we got here. We got this generic Ric Flair. Where's he at? Look at that guy. Look at that guy. That is not Ric Flair. That's not even close to. That's the best they could do for Ric Flair. I mean, the robe's okay, right? The robe's not bad. Not bad. Oh, this kind of almost looks like a ribbon here, like a fucking karate belt. But it's not bad. But this guy, who is that anyway? I wonder who's even playing him. But that's a bad, bad fucking Ric Flair. They did shit job there. Shit job there. What are these uh, free birds here? That's that's what we want to see together. We can do anything. Look at that, Michael Hayes. I have a funny story. I'll tell it here. Funny story when I uh, I ended up I was working in this call center place and there was this lady from Texas that worked there, 
and she found out I was a wrestling fan, and she said, she was an older lady, right? And she's like, oh, I used to go to the Sportatorium oh, down in Dallas. She's like, oh, that Michael Hayes. She was fucking in love. She loved her some P.S. Hayes. When people wonder, like, how did that guy, why did, why was he so sexy? Chicks dug the fucking hair. Oh, that blonde hair. Oh, that P.S. Hayes. I'll never, ever, ever forget that story. I laughed so hard on the inside. I didn't laugh in her face. It was like, doot, doot, doot. It's not a bad, I mean, hard to get. I'm trying to see if we can get paused right in on like a facial feature like we did. But it seems to be, you know, all action. But just, you know, at a glance, the action shots look fantastic. That's what I'm impressed with here. You know, the 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 action in this fucking look at this shit. This doesn't look bad at all. You know, like the background, they got it lit and the crowd and stuff to to that's a believable sportatorium. They got the fucking rope for the barriers like that. They got the ring colors down. Look at this fucking the Von Erickson there. Look at that fucking triple clothesline. Eat that fucking Adam Cole and MJF. And then look at this. Look at that sportatorium, dude. And look at the fucking... Look at these guys. Dude, they're nailing it. They nailed it. As far as, like, the look and stuff... Look, I'm a picky guy, right? You look at Young Rock, like I did with Ric Flair there. Like, I, Ric Flair looks like shit. But as far as the Von Erics go, what I could see of the Freebirds, the sportatorium, the crowd, the atmosphere, the way that it's filmed, the vibe that they're going for, all of this is fucking amazing. Very good job. A24, they have a, quite the reputation that they're building for themselves here. Uh, I don't know what kind of distribution this film is going to get, if it's going to be in theaters uh, or, or what nationwide theaters or if it's going to be find its way on the streaming sometime soon. Uh, for those of you that haven't watched Shameless or don't know this guy who's playing Carrie Von Eric, the Texas Tornado, he's a very, very good actor. Like, a very good actor. Wide of emotional range, you know. He'll be able to cry like a little fucking baby in here. He'll be able to get pissed and outraged. He plays those emotional ranges fantastic. So he's a brilliant casting for this, to be honest with you. Um, Zac Efron's talented as all fuck, too. Uh, whoever's sleeping on Zac Efron or thought he was, you know, like still think of him as like the, uh, you know, the teen pretty boy guy or whatever. Like he's... He's played, he can play a wide range of character. And I think, you know, given the opportunity to sink himself into something deep here, he's going to nail it. This looks dope. I'm thoroughly impressed. Uh, I can only suck his dick so hard, though. It already came twice. What are your guys' thoughts? Let me know down in the comments below. Are you excited to see this movie? Do you like wrestling movies like this where they like. Whether fake or real, you know, like, uh, not fake or real, but, you know, like, uh, I, I guess, like, Randy the Ram, right? The wrestler was fake land, a different universe. Or this portraying something that actually happened with real characters. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments all about it. While you're there, hit the subscribe button. And uh, one of these would be nice, too, or two. I don't know. Can you do two? Do give, give at least one. But we'll give me one of those. On to the next. Well, lead singer of the Smashing Pumpkins and all-around creepy bastard, Billy Corgan, owner of the NWA National Wrestling Alliance, was on the Busted Open radio show this week talking about their big new gimmick that they're planning out for the NWA's expansion. It's a new idea that's really an idea as old as the wrestling business itself. Billy Corgan is bringing back, wait for it, the territory system. 
That's what we need. More wrestling, more wrestling promotions, more NWAs. Check out this clip. Yeah, the other night we announced at uh, Exodus Pro, which is EC3's new promotion in Cleveland. He's moved back home after years of being in Florida and uh, would look like a sold out crowd to me. And we were able to make this uh, announcement and the reaction to the announcement of the first sort of new regional territory under my my watch. Um, the response has been incredible. Uh, we received requests from all over the world. Um, I mean, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 requests of people wanting to be involved. So we're sorting through those now. And we certainly take all those requests seriously. Um, in the short term, we're, you know, we're going to mostly work with people that we have existing relationships with. And um, I think the opportunities are, are self-evident. You know, not only can we bring some of the top NWA stars into a particular territory to help their houses and uh, and their local focus, but also we need to develop the stars of tomorrow, which I think uh, is pretty uh, important, especially for a company like the NWA. Because I really do believe that what fans really, really want to see beyond established stars like yourself is they want to see new stories, new new faces break. And so we have to do a better job of finding them early on. Um, and that's sort of part of what we're going to do. Think of it as a triple A system. And I think it benefits both ways. And obviously it's going to benefit EC3 in, in the in the long term, because at any point he can call me up and say, hey, I'd like to bring in these champions. And, and he has access to all the belts. Now, this isn't bad in theory, right? Essentially, what he's doing is he's putting himself together a little bit of a feeder system. And in return, he's got these places will be able to get access to NWA titles and NWA characters, wrestlers, personalities, and uh, probably be able to get themselves a plug on NWA TV and, you know, that kind of thing. So... Uh, it's a win-win here. He specifically said, think of it as like a triple A. So it's a minor league feeder system is what he's putting together for himself. Sanctioned under the NWA as a form of a territory system. Of course, this is how the old school NWA was structured. We all know that. Uh, what a lot of you don't know is right around the time that uh, Impact Wrestling or TNA at the time when they first started, they joined into what was left of this territory system. The NWA was still alive. It never died. It was on its last breath. It was old, fucking dusty, fucking beat up, ragged on its last legs. But the NWA, as its own existing entity, still existed. And what they were doing is they were prying on independent promotions and they were basically trying to exist off of their name by getting independent promotions to brand themselves as NWA. You know, NWA fucking Wisconsin, for example, was a was a promotion, right? Where they would kick back a percentage of a house or pay an annual fee or whatever the case may be. It was a scam is what it was. We'll give you the NWA branding to make you feel and sound more legitimate. And in return, we get kickbacks on your stuff. And, you know, that could end up coming with control and a dick up the ass, too, depending on the territory. Right. So obviously that existed all the way basically up until Billy Corgan got a hold of it. And I don't think there were really anything left. Um, I, I vaguely, and I could, this could just be like me making stuff up in my own head, but I, somehow I vaguely remember, uh, Billy talking about buying out a few remaining little piece portions of it or whatever, when he was getting the NWA back together, uh, under one roof or whatever. I don't fucking know, but in any event, Billy owns it all now and nobody's doing that shit until now. Now he's going to go back out and he's going to be doing this. I don't think it's going to be set up as a scam necessarily. It will be his feeder system. But how much will it actually benefit anybody? That remains to be seen. You know, does it come with any kind of clause where, you know, Billy's going to have say on whatever, whatever? Or is it just going to be a really kind of a working deal similar to where, you know, an NWA territory could get the NWA traveling champion like Ric Flair? Maybe they can get EC3 or they can get, you know, Camille or something uh, for a show, stuff like that. And in return, these are the promotions that Billy's going to keep an eye on for talent to come in. 
or you know maybe he'll s- slip them a little bit of production value or who knows what how all this will play out it will be interesting to see i do not see this as another one of those scam things that just kind of scrape a little bit of money off the indie system but i don't know how it'll help everybody out but that'll remain to be seen now another big thing that billy talked about in this interview which kind of burying the lead here uh, even though I did want to touch on that because that's that's huge too in its own right. Uh, but the, I think the more important story here is that NWA has a TV deal. A TV deal with at least a top 20. And not just one TV deal, but two. We don't know much more about that. But for more details, in his own words, Mr. Smashing Pumpkins giving his two cents on the two TV deals. Check out this clip. YouTube is a terrible partner for wrestling. I'm just going to say that flat out. And lately, because of who knows how these AI systems work, they've been squeezing all the wrestling content creators. No one can quite figure it out, but everybody's numbers are down, and that's across the board. So God knows why YouTube's doing what it's doing, but it, it is very mercurial, and it's and we can't even put ads on YouTube because they keep labeling any ads we put. Even if it's just Jim Mitchell saying, come watch Saw win the pay-per-view, it gets a, a ban for being offensive. And we can't find anybody to talk to you to tell you why you can't put an ad on there. So even when we're trying to spend money to get people to watch our programming, we can't. So five years ago, yes, YouTube, good place to start. It helped us build the brand, uh, you know, starting with the debut power, which we just passed our fourth anniversary. And uh, thanks to people like The Rock for putting it over. It kind of put us on the map. And so it's been an effective way. But now, and this goes back to Bully's question, I can now say for the first time, and I have to be a bit vague because there's some other political aspects to this, but I can now say that we finally have signed not just one, but two television deals. And that announcement as far as where and who uh, will be coming soon. But we finally now will be able to move off YouTube, not exclusively because we want to still do stuff on YouTube, but we now will be moving with a network partner. So where and who? That's what I said. I have to be vague. I can't say who, but I can't say I can't say it's 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 a top it's a top twenty, uh, and uh, network. And uh, very excited. I've been working on this for over a year. And like I said, not just one, but two television deals are involved. Two totally different uh, wrestling uh, related products uh, that we'll be offering. So twenty twenty four is looking very very bright. We're very excited. This was his plan. This was his goal right from the very beginning. This is, was his stated mission. He was going to take the NWA back in under house, and he was going to build it up and get it a TV deal and try to reach a market that WWE and AEW aren't reaching. Mix that with fucking what uh, um, Freddie Prince Jr. is starting up. All over the place, you got uh, and New Japan strong here in the United States. Impact. There's so many wrestling options. It's oversaturated. But NWA is making a huge step in getting themselves on TV. So their content will not have to resort to only being on YouTube. It was a good plan by Billy Corgan. It seems to be working out for him. He got himself that deal. And of course, it doesn't hurt to have Billy Corgan pitching it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm excited to see what they come up with. This is going to come with more money, which I think should increase the production value. They're always a little bit dingy and stuff. Uh, I think that was the idea to start with, but I think Billy's kind of stated that he might be looking to move away from that now going forward. Um. He certainly has plenty of money to put into this company, but he's running a business here. Trying to run a business here. He's not just a mark playing with his toys, you know what I mean? So he wants the company to fund itself. Now it has a TV deal. Of course, AEW funds itself too. Hey, who said I was talking about AEW anyway? Anybody could be run by a mark. Um, But Billy Corgan... Uh, making big moves for the NWA. I'm excited to see what it brings. It's could it's nothing but good to the wrestling business. Yeah, it's too much cake. Of course, it's already too much cake. But uh, wrestlers have more places to work, more eyeballs on them, more money coming into professional wrestling. Billy can pay more people, bring in bigger names, have a higher production value. All of these are good things. So be happy for him. 
And uh, though we don't know where he's going, I'll certainly update you on that. As he said that he would un- make that announcement on Busted Open. So we'll have it here as soon as he does, when he does, whenever that happens. But let me know your thoughts. What do you think of Billy Corgan bringing back the territories? What do you think of NWA getting a TV deal? Do you watch NWA? Do you like their presentation? Do you like their style? Do, are you happy for them even if you're not? Or are you like, fuck them because they have Tyrus and Trevor Murdoch and EC3 and all these guys? These guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Hit the... Um, the subscribe subscribe gimmick thing down there, whatever that is. Like button, like button it up. Do that for me. On to the next. That's it, y'all. Another episode in the can. Episode 90, motherfucking two, on our way up to 100. Motherfucker, motherfucker. Um, hit the subscribe button. Let me get to a thousand subscribers. I know I'm plugging it hard, but I'm like, I'm so close. I'm so close that I gotta, it's, you know, it's the hard push at the end. You know, it's the go home push, if you will. Um, another huge episode in the can. Lots to talk about stuff. I wasn't even able to get to podcasts. I wasn't even able to listen to this week. Really wanted to check out Swerve was on uh, Fightful. He did an interview with Fightful this week. Didn't get a chance to even listen to that. Man, a lot going on in the world. I'm glad I got to do the reaction, though. That was fun. Reaction to that trailer. Um, That was kind of something that I was looking forward to doing with you guys. But that's really all I got for you. I don't know. We can sit and chat. We can hang out. What's on your mind? How you guys doing? How are you guys doing? I put out some more shorts last week. I'm trying to do those where I can. I don't know how consistent those can be. Um, Doing my best. But uh, that was fun. Got a nice little plop pop from the shorts. I'm going to try to kick some more of those out as I can. Uh, I do have some other projects that are in the works here for the month of October. Uh, I see WWE kind of already beat me 2-1 with like it's uh, scariest characters of all time or whatever. 25, I was going to do a, I'm going to do a list of wrestling horror characters. And of course, it'll be a different list, but uh, we are in that season. I'm going to do a lot of other fun things too. I'm going to be busy this season trying to crank out a shit ton of content. And uh, that's it. That's where I'm at. Peace, love, and pizza. Another episode down. I love you guys. Hit the subscribe if you're able to. If you haven't yet, for fuck's sakes, I said it 30 times. My name is Seth Grimes, and this has been the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast. Flair? Oh, Ric Flair. Yeah. Oh. He was the talk of the town I forgot this about week. that. That was a rough one. Yeah. So I, forgot, I forgot music. all about it because it came out three weeks after we did it. I know. But <laughs> and I was like, I, I totally forgot. And then I was looking at YouTube and I was like, oh, no. It went crazy Ooh. viral. Yeah. That one's that one's. He rough. talked about Asian pussy for 20 minutes. Did they then, keep that in there? I didn't watch it. I think they didn't. They oh, edited that part out. That's very funny. Are you there? You watched it live? I watched it on YouTube, and the uh, the producer guy was telling me that they edited a lot out. Requested oh. that a lot of it was. Well, that doesn't, make sense. that doesn't make sense. That, yeah, because no. then I was like, whenever he was like, "You guys are mean," I was like, "You were just yes, <laughs> crazy racist." Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I yeah. said Asian pussy twenty times, just making fun of him, and it would get a laugh, but.
now they're the yeah, if there's regular. one thing if there's one thing you know about Ric Flair what is it I'd be like you're a wrestler uh, one of the great promoters well you'd be wrong it's yeah. that I respect people's time that I will never make someone who donates their time that's the one thing you know I about Ric that. Flair yeah and his son died <laughs> his son died was uh, yeah so yeah. as soon as he brought that up I was like alright I'm out yeah. I'm not gonna make fun of him one more time this is yeah, very I, well, sad now. I had a bunch of like I see you nah, guys nah, kept nah, fucking nah, going. Every that. time someone else did it, I was that's like, yo, Lew- who is doing this? That's what Lewis Gomez is there for. Yeah, he just he slid went. right in and rattlesnaked yeah. it up about <laughs> <Yeah>. his dead <laughs> son. <laughs> yeah, he was he was ready for it. Yeah. But yep. great time.